Uh, next up is a speaker whose name is Chris. And actually, people like Chris are uh, the reason why I'm so excited and I was so excited about uh, Swift being open source. Um, Chris has a, actually a massive background on Java Enterprise Edition or Node.js. And uh, he's bringing his, his uh, experience into Swift. He's, uh, he's working at IBM right now, and uh, he will talk to you about uh, Swift into the server. OK, thank you. <clears throat> so as has just been mentioned, uh, my name is Chris Bailey, and I work for IBM as part of the Swift at IBM engineering team. Um, I'm on Twitter. Very difficult to find because there's two underscores in my name, so you probably take a bit of effort to find me. Um, but as has just been mentioned, I've spent around 15 years working on Java runtimes. Um, I spent about two years working on Node.js, and since the open source announcement on December 3rd last year, I've been working on Swift um, alongside a number of colleagues in IBM. Um, and what I'm going to try and talk to you about over the next 30 minutes is, first of all, um, why there's an advantage to using Swift on both the front end and the back end of your application. So why you should do end-to-end -end application development in Swift. And then I'm going to show you, hopefully, how to do it um, and how to get up and running and get started. So when we think about people building applications, um, we think about there being end users. Um, and those are going to be using client-facing apps, which as this is a, a Swift conference, we expect, hopefully, all of you are using Swift for their client-facing apps. And that those apps um, probably will have some kind of um, application-specific uh, services. Um, and you're probably writing those in Java or Node.js or Ruby today. Um, and those application-specific services, as well as doing things like storing data or providing function, might be using third-party services like databases like Twitter, um, authentication, um, or Twilio, or, or services like that, as well as potentially you know, old legacy systems um, on-premise, so you know, standard databases like MySQL, like DB2, or um, Oracle DB. So what we're going to try and convince you is rather than just using Swift for user-facing apps, you also want to be using Swift on the back end as a replacement for Java, for Node.js, and for Ruby. Um, and if you do that, that gives you the advantage that you have an integrated developer experience. And we think this is important because whilst you, know, you get called an iOS developer, you're really actually a product person. You're not just developing code. You own the full experience of the application. You're an application designer. As we saw this morning, people you know, are providing sessions that talked about how to create and design applications, not just do the coding under it. So the more of the experience that you own, the better end-to-end -end capability set that you can provide to your users. And you've also got the ability to, to share data and code, which is kind of useful as well. Now, one of the questions is, you know, why Swift on the server? You know, we kind of understand that the benefit of sharing code might be there, but is Swift actually a good language to be using on the server in the first place? Well, um, in one of the earlier sessions with Bruno, there was a question afterwards about how does the performance of Swift compare to C and other languages? Well, it happened to be quite a good tee up for this because one of the reasons to use Swift on the server is performance. So there's an independent group um, that creates some uh, tests called the Benchmarks Game. Now, they are fairly simple uh, mathematical algorithms that they run, um, and they test the performance of the given language. Now, um, as I said, they're very mathematical algorithms, so they kind of equate to what Bruno was doing in terms of image processing. So it's that sort of work that does mathematics and crunches CPU time. Um, they run the tests on Linux boxes. Uh, they cover many, many languages. I'm just going to show you a, a handful of them. Um, they run on four CPUs, so it uses more than one you know, concurrent piece of work at the same time. Um, and the Swift implementation of that uh, completed in four seconds. Uh, the Swift implementation uses dispatch for concurrency um, and uses the standard library for its language constructs. So the test completes in four seconds, which is pretty good. Um, when you, we run the same test with Java, 
Java actually completes in 4.3 seconds. So Swift was actually slightly faster than Java for this particular benchmark. And that's really impressive because Swift has only been around for a couple of years. Um, and as I said, I spent 15 years working on Java, and Java's actually 22 years old. So Java's had a long time to get to the performance level that it's at now, whereas Swift has managed to get to parity very, very quickly. Um, and we know that there's things that can be done to Swift to improve Swift's performance, and, and we'll, we'll see that improve over time. So we've got about the same performance as we have for Java. Um, so how does that compare to Node.js? Well, Node.js took almost 16 seconds to complete. So Node.js is four times slower than Swift at this number-crunching benchmark. Um, and we also compared to Ruby, and Ruby is significantly slower. Now, there's good reasons for this. Um, Swift is a compiled language, so you get the benefits of compilation. And Java actually is as well, because it does compilation at runtime with the just-in-time compiler. So both of these are compiled. Um, and actually, Node.js has the same thing. It has runtime compilation, um, but it's a bit slower because it's a dynamic language. It lacks typing. So typing gives you a performance boost. Now, Ruby has the worst of both worlds. It doesn't have typing, and it doesn't have runtime compilation. So that's why it's such a slow language. But what we can see here is that Swift is actually a really fast language to be running on a server. And as I said, this was a, a four CPU uh, Linux machine, the same machine being used for all of the tests. So Swift is actually performant, and that's great for server applications where we care about scale and we care about ultimate throughput and responsiveness. Um, so are there any other ways in which Swift is good? Well, um, memory is actually quite a good statement. So when we ran the benchmark, the, the same people, um, they provide information on the amount of physical memory the application uses when it runs the test. So this is the real amount of RAM that you're using to run it. Now, in the case of Swift, it uses 15 megabytes worth of RAM to run that particular benchmark. Uh, Java uses 30 or so megabytes, so it's over twice the size. Now, again, that's unsurprising. If you know Java, you understand that it has this whole runtime that has to be started up, and it has a, a Java garbage collected heap. So that uses a large amount of memory as well. Um, and Node.js actually sits in the middle. It's actually a bit similar to Java in that it has a runtime and it has a heap, uh, but it's not as large as Java is. Um, and Ruby is, again, fairly huge. So, um, yeah, Ruby's not the best fit for, for either of these. But what this means is that Swift is both a highly performant language and a small one. And that's actually really critical if you ever need to deploy an application to the cloud. Because almost every single cloud charges your deployment according to gigabyte hours or some form of charge per memory. Right, you go to AWS and you'll get a two gig image or you'll get a four gig image. So the amount that you're paying is done on memory. And it's the same for lots of PaaSes, so platform as a service clouds. Those particularly will charge you specifically on the amount of memory that you use for the number of hours in which you use them. So having a highly performant language that uses very little memory is very, very good for cloud deployments. So that means that Swift is actually an ideal language for the cloud, simply because of the high performance and low memory cost uh, characteristics. So that's one really good reason to use Swift on the server. Um, and the other is around this isomorphic development. So the idea of being able to use the same code on client and server and being able to share code between the two. So what we're talking about is a model where you, as a developer, you get to create a project in Xcode. And that one project can contain both server and client components, which means that you can actually decide to move code from the client to the server if it makes sense to do that. You, know, you might want to actually offload large data crunching tasks to a server rather than running them on your iPhone where they're going to burn lots of CPU and therefore lots of battery. Um, or you can actually decide to run the code in one place or the other dynamically, depending on things like how good your network connection is versus how much battery life you have. So you can dynamically move code from one to the other, and you can have data models where you have the same accessor for it written in the same code running in both places. So you don't have to have an argument with your back-end guy when you've decided you want a data model change and you have to version sync both sides and so on. So you've created your project, 
and then you get to deploy it to both client and server, um, and get some kind of swagger defined API in the middle in case you have clients not running on iOS devices that want to use the same REST defined API. So all of this means that you've got one developer or a small number of developers focusing on one set of skills, learning Swift and not having to learn several other languages, not having to mentally switch between the two, and being able to create end-to-end -end applications in Swift. And you also get to share tools and technologies as you go. So once you've learned how to use instruments, you don't have to go and learn how to use the other profiler for the other language. Um, once you've learned how to use cloud tools, once you've learned how to do profiling and monitoring, you only ever have to do all of this once. So how do we actually get to the point that that all, which sounds great, becomes true? Well, the first thing is we needed to extend Swift to the server. Um, and that all started on December the 3rd last year when there was the announcement of Swift open source. <coughs> so a couple of really good things happened. Um, the first was that not only did Swift go open source, um, but they did so under a fairly permissive license and a fairly permissive governance model. Um, so they chose Apache 2.0 which is um, a pretty um, tolerant license. It includes patent protection. It allows people to contribute but keep their copyright. It allows people to use it in their own stuff without having to give away all of their IP. So it's not viral like things like the GPL are. And that's actually helped to engender um, a lot of people contributing to Swift. Um, so when Jesse Squires spoke earlier, one of the questions there was afterwards was about, you know, is, is it difficult to get involved in Swift.org? Um, and the truth of the matter is, no, not really. Uh, since December 3rd last year, there's been over 6,500 pull requests merged into the project. There's been over 750 individuals contributing. So a vast number of people from different areas contributing code to Swift.org. And large parts of it are written in Swift and your Swift developers. And that means that it's very easy to contribute. As Jesse said, you know, it makes sense to post stuff on the mailing list first, you know, um, sound people out for things that you want to do or get their input before going off and writing large amounts of code. Uh, but it's fairly simple to do. And the use of Apache 2.0 and this open source uh, um, uh, model has really helped Swift take off. So where we were on December 3rd, was we had Swift on Mac, and we had a version on Linux which was just about working. It was early days. Um, but since then, um, the Linux Intel version has become far, far more solid. We now have you know, good working versions of Foundation and Dispatch. Um, but there's also been efforts to get Linux working on what's called Linux One, which is Linux on mainframes, you know, proper, big, iron hardware. Um, and at the other end of the scale, there is now a version of Swift that is running on Raspberry Pi, um, so on an embedded ARM device. And if you've been tracking the projects, there's been a few attempts to merge some code in to get Swift compiling and running on Android, and that actually does work today. So suddenly we've gone in under a year from having Swift as a language on just um, Apple devices to Linux, Intel, Linux mainframes, Linux on a Raspberry Pi, and Linux on Android. So that's really, really taken off over the last nine months or so. So where we were on December 3rd was on Linux, we really had the Swift language and the standard library, which gives us typing in maths and so on. Um, and there was an early version of Foundation, but we've made Foundation far more concrete. We've now got fully working implementations of things like NS operation and URL session um, in there that went out in Swift 3 just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we also have a fully working version of dispatch. So there's full concurrency, dispatch is fully compliant, um, and we now have you know, a good, solid, consistent runtime across platforms. So code that you can run on Mac now runs on Linux Intel and shortly will run on mainframes, Raspberry Pis, hopefully Android and so on. So that gives us Swift on Linux. Um, but the next thing that we need to do Swift on the server is some kind of web framework. And since 
you know, roughly the beginning of the year, um, there's been huge strides on that front. There's been a huge number of web frameworks that have appeared, and just a handful of them are up on the screen. You have Zwoo, you have Blackfish, you have Perfect, you have Vapor. Um, a large number of different web frameworks have appeared very, very quickly, showing the kind of interest that people have in being able to run Swift on the server. And of course, I'm going to talk about Kitora, the one in the middle, because that's the one that the IBM engineering team have been working on. So Kitora, which became version 1.0 yesterday, um, is a full web framework and HTTP server. Um, there's full documentation on Kitora.io. Um, but what this does is it provides you a full um, web framework with full HTTPS security. There's ability to do authentication. There's ability to connect to backend databases. Uh, we have documentation and samples available. Um, and all of this is now 1.0 and fully ready for production use. Um, one of the key bits of Kitora is that we've been working very hard to use standard components. So we use foundation ourselves, we use dispatch ourselves. And we did that as a deliberate decision. So we wanted to use things like foundation so that when you use third party packages um, and you have data that comes in on a URL, you can hand it to that third party package and it's using things like data, which they expect. So you get better interoperability. Uh, we wanted to use dispatch because there's nothing worse than having conflicts between concurrency frameworks in your code. Right? Dispatch intentionally will try and use every available CPU. If you then have a second concurrency framework that's trying to use every available CPU, you get huge conflicts. And because dispatch is the standard, we wanted to make sure that we were using the same thing as any other third-party code that's being plugged into the system. So what this now looks like is we have our client and we have our server on Linux. And in order to get Kitora up and running, um, we did actually have to add a couple of non-standard components. So whilst we use Foundation, and Foundation does provide networking, uh, we do actually have to provide our own networking layer. And this is because Foundation doesn't provide things like server sockets. You can't listen to incoming connections. So we had to add that. Um, and we also had to add security. So in order to provide HTTPS support, we need to have a security layer. Um, so we provided that. And we also provided HTTP parsing, because again, whilst things like URL session will do outbound HTTP, it doesn't do inbound. Now, on top of that, we add our web framework. And when you're building an application on the client, you now have this um, you know, golden capability of being able to take your application libraries from the client and share them with application code on the server. So that's how we're starting to build this end-to-end -end story. Now, I did say that um, we've made a big point of wanting to build on standard components, which is why we use Foundation, which is why we use Dispatch. So one of the things that we've been doing is we've been working with Apple, um, and we've been talking to some of the other framework vendors, the likes of Vapor and the likes of Zwoo and Perfect, on getting rid of those non-standard components. So what we want to do is have Swift, use the standard library foundation and dispatch, and use some standard server APIs. So in the next couple of weeks, you should see an announcement about the launching of a work group to start developing those server APIs as part of swift.org as an open source project. OK, so that finally means that Swift 3 from a couple of weeks ago and Kitora 1.0 from yesterday means that Swift on the server is now real. It's fully possible to build those applications, fully secure, fully tested, and run back-end Swift um, on the server on Linux. So now that I've said it's possible, um, let's take a look and see how that actually works and how you can do that. So first of all, uh, the boring stuff, the architecture. So we have our web framework. Um, as I said, that's built on standard um, Swift components. So we use Dispatch, we use Foundation, we use Package Manager in order to do the install and build. Um, we use some community libraries. So we use Swifty JSON, like I guess most people do for JSON. Um, we use Swift MongoDB and a few other things. Um, we have the C libraries that I talked about. So where we have um, our HTTP parsing, that's currently built using HTTP parser, which is an open source C library, which we also contribute to. 
Um, we use um, curl, the curl library, for doing some outbound connections. Um, we use PCRE, we use High Redis, and these are all open source C libraries which we're hoping to get rid of. Um, and we have um, a number of pluggable components depending on what function you're trying to use in your application. So things like OAuth is pluggable, database connections are pluggable. And that drops out with our Katura framework. And as I said, we're trying to get rid of those C libraries and replace them with Swift libraries, which is what we'll be doing, hopefully targeting for, for either Swift 3.1 or Swift 4. So let's actually build an application. Now, this should be put something that's possible by anyone in under two and a half minutes. So it really is very, very simple. Um, and we timed that by going out and trying to find someone non-technical that we could task to go through the process. Um, and after trying you know, wives and girlfriends and friends and trying to find someone really not technical, uh, we found the perfect person, uh, my manager. <laughs> so he went through this process and it took him uh, just under two and a half minutes. So the first thing you do is you create your project directory. Um, it's in this case called my first project. If you're creating your second project, you'll have to type that yourself. You can't cut and paste it from our instructions, so it takes a little bit longer. Um, you then run Swift package in it to uh, use Swift package manager to create the contents of that project. So it sets up a package.swift file, it sets up a sources directory, and so on. Um, and oh, if the click is working, there we go. OK. Inside that package.swift file, you really have to add one line, which is the package dependency on the Kitora project in the IBM Swift organization on GitHub. Um, and that's it. At this point, you now have the boilerplate framework for a Kitora application. OK, next, you actually have to write some code. Um, and you need to write eight lines of it. So the first is just to import Kitora. So that says we want to run Katora. Um, then the next key bit is you create a router. Um, and this is where all of the magic um, runs in terms of being able to respond to URLs. So in that router, you can then add uh, URLs that you want to be able to respond on. So where we do router.get, this says when someone makes a get request to whatever path you put in there, this is the code that you want to run. You have a request. A, a object, a response object, and a next. And next allows multiple uh, code functions to be called on any given, um, any given route, and we actually have matching for routes. Um, and in this case, we're just going to send back hello world. So the reason you then call next is in case something else wants to respond to it, and you might use that for something like authentication. So you can do authentication globally for all routes, um, and you can then have individual responses on individual routes. So now that I've set up my router, I finally have to say, create an HTTP server, give it a port, and pass it the router that you want to respond on it. Now, there's full support for adding multiple ports, so you can have listeners on as many ports as you like, um, and you have the ability to do HTTPS as well as plain HTTP. And then you finally call Katora.run, which invokes a run loop because we use dispatch, and your application will run forever responding on those requests. So that's it. In eight lines of code, you've gone from a front-end developer to a back-end developer. So last thing to do is just to deploy it. Um, so the first thing you do is Swift build. And this is actually where most of that two and a half minutes goes. Um, the way that Swift Package Manager works is it pulls the dependencies down from GitHub and then has to compile them. So you get to sit there for about two of the two and a half minutes waiting for this to happen. Um, most of that cost is one-off because once you pull the dependencies down from GitHub, subsequent builds don't need to do that, so it's just the compile time. But once you've done that, you then just have to open your browser, and there you go. You have your Katoro application up and running. So that should take about two and a half minutes. And it's, it, for anyone coming along to the workshop tomorrow, this is the first thing that we'll do. Uh, but we have several other exercises that we can go through afterwards. Um, and basically, anyone not doing it in two and a half minute, minutes uh, needs to become a manager. <laughs> so 
This means that we've built Hello World. And Hello World is fine as a, uh, an example, but it's not very useful for real applications. So what we've done is, uh, between us and a number of other people in the community, um, we've built a number of connectors to work with existing services. Um, some of them we've built, some of them we've worked with the community on, some of them we've just taken from the community and tested to make sure that they work with Katora. Um, and a subset of them are here. So obviously you may want to do some kind of authentication. So we do HTTP, Basic and Digest, but we also do Facebook, Google and GitHub, so you can check credentials. Um, if you're interested in IoT, we have an MQTT connector, MQTT being the messaging um, telemetry transport protocol, which is commonly used for IoT. And we've got connectors to IBM Watson in case you want to do things like analytics and sentiment analysis. Um, and we support a whole raft of data stores. So MySQL, Apache Cassandra, Postgres, uh, CouchDB in Cloudant, um, Redis, you know, that's the set that we have today that's expanding all the time. And in all honesty, you know, it's one of those things that if people can tell us which data stores they want to use or which services they want to use, then it makes it easier for us to know which ones to start developing. So that means you can build applications and you can deploy them to your local machine. Um, but if you're running a, a real server application, you probably need to deploy it to some kind of hosted environment. So we also have Deploy to Cloud. Um, and currently, we have Docker support. So we have a Docker image that's available. Uh, who here uses Docker? Anyone? Yep, so quite a few of you that I can see in the dark. Um, so we have Docker support, and we also have support for IBM's cloud, which is called Bluemix. So again, yesterday, we announced the, the GA, the general availability, so the production release of Swift in Bluemix. Um, there's a, uh, a starter application there which you can clone and then push to Bluemix and that basically does the Hello World example for you in again around about two and a half minutes and you have a public URL that you can use. Um, as well as having the environment, we also have um, some cloud tools. So the cloud tools make it easy for you to uh, create and deploy your application to the cloud. Um, and in fact, um, again, um, in the last week, we released the capability to actually take a GitHub project and say, I want to take that GitHub project and push it to the cloud. So it will create projects for you for use inside Xcode. It will uh, let you deploy and then manage the application once it's in the cloud and basically make it easy for you to, to manage and deploy cloud applications from inside your uh, MacBook Pro or um, I don't think we actually have a version for... Um, for iPad Pro yet, but by the sounds of things, maybe we should have a look at that. Okay, so that's great, um, but how do I learn more? Well, I've shown you Hello World, and I've said it's possible to use these data stores, and I said that it's possible for you to use Watson and MQTT and credentials. Um, so the other thing that we've been doing as part of our 1.0 release is to improve the documentation. So we added the Katora.io website, which went out yesterday. And on there, there's a whole bunch of tutorials. So um, there's this um, uh, public backend ex building exercise called To-Do List. So we've got To-Do List examples for something like six or seven different backend databases. Uh, we've got examples of how to do authentication for Facebook, for GitHub, and so on. Uh, we've got the ability to sort, store session data using Katora Session, so we've got an example of that. We show you how to use HTTP, we show you how to use templating engines, so we've got support for GR Mustache and for Stencil, um, and we show you how to do things like doing response handlers and parsing requests. So all of that's available on the website, and again, we'll go through some of that in the workshop tomorrow if you come along to that. Okay, and finally, um, as well as the tutorials, which are kind of like how to do a specific tasks, we've currently built two end-to-end -end examples. One of them is called BluePick. Um, so this provides both a client and a back-end server. Um, and recently, we've done something called Blitter, which is to build um, an example back-end for some kind of social messaging network. Um, and both of those are, again, available on GitHub for you to download, take a look at, and, you know, start to take some inspiration about how to build your own back-end code in Swift. 
Okay, um, so that's largely all that I had. Um, the Swifter IBM team also works on some other stuff. We have the Swift package catalog, which is a way of finding Swift compliant packages on GitHub. We have the Swift sandbox that lets you actually try code running on Swift in the cloud on Linux, as well as Katora and the IBM cloud tools that I covered. If you want to know more information, just go to the URL there. Okay, thank you. So that was that was amazing. Uh, yeah, we were receiving lots and lots of questions. Actually, uh, your talk broke the Twitter. Uh, yeah, we, we should be using Blitter. Uh, Blitter, <laughs> our uh, our back end. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the social network. Uh, as we've, um, uh, we have lots of questions. I don't know where uh, to start. Yeah, I'd like to start with the announcement. I'm not sure, like, to get all the impact that your uh, recent announcement uh, made. Well, yeah, so the, the key bit really was that um, we started doing Kitura around about the same time that Swift was announced as open source. And we've been developing function to get to the point that it becomes a real framework that you can do for real workloads. But we've also been fighting the fact that Swift has been evolving rapidly. Right? They went through 140 proposals, of which 77% were approved and 70% got done. And that nice, meant nice every memory. two weeks, we spent a lot of time making Kitora work against the next version. And we had to do that to fix any regressions that were happening in Dispatch and Foundation and Swift. So because of Swift 3 a couple of weeks back, um, that's given us our final chance to actually close things down, do stress testing. And yeah, yesterday we got to the point that we reached 1.0, which in IBM terms is actually quite a big deal. We go through a lot of process to say that something becomes 1.0. So yes, it's you mean now IBM processes. Well, yeah, we Whoa. love red tape. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, about the the involvement of IBM, like, can you can you comment on on why IBM is actually uh, involved in in Swift and especially on the server side? It's kind of like uh, yeah, a, a so big question. So. I'm not sure if it's still true, but um, certainly around about a year ago, um, it was a true statement that IBM was the biggest Swift development shop in the world. So through this uh, mobile first partnership with Apple, we've been building a whole load of iOS applications in Swift. Now, most of those have some kind of back end. And we, like everybody else, have been using Node.js, Ruby, Java, PARS, and so on. Um, and one of our goals was to start using Swift on the back end ourselves. So to do that, we needed to build our own framework. And that's where a lot of that involvement has started to come from. Our, our general approach is, if we're going to use a language ourselves, we're going to contribute to it. And anything that's you know, kind of like web frameworks and language constructs, you know, that should be open source. Yeah, so, it makes so that's sense, why. but it, it's, a big, it's a big gamble. Like we need to use that on the on the server side for us. Then we're going to build the whole ecosystem. Like that's that's quite nice that you guys uh, are doing that because I'm sure like we're going we're going to benefit from that. Um, and uh, speaking about about um, to talk more about technical things like memory management, uh, there is this uh, great uh, benchmark that I was really not aware of. Um, but did you compare with the uh, Swift? Like, did you have? Did you see any improvements? Um, so, between, well, over the last three, four months, the the performance of Swift from the development drivers to 3.0 have been roughly stable. Um, there's actually been uh, a couple of regressions, um, and we know we need to fix those. So, one of the interesting side effects of um, certainly on Linux of introducing data as the structure type over NS data is that data, whilst you expect it to be faster because it's a strut, yeah. is actually about 20 times slower. Um, so what it's a regression that? that needs fixing. OK, that's, that's just, just a bug. It's not yeah. an architectural issue. No, it, it's okay. a bug that needs fixing. And okay. about like this, there's something that you don't mention. is like all those languages, they just don't manage memory. So that's probably one of the reasons. But most of the programmers are actually afraid of uh, being, uh, having to uh, handle the memory. Um, do you think it's, it could be an issue? Like when you do Java, like you have a garbage collector and, and same for uh, uh, Node.js and same for Ruby, but 
in the Swift uh, environment, then it's a bit more manual and you have to understand what you're doing. Yeah, well, I mean, you have reference counting. Yeah, that's so great. So it then. will create and destroy objects for you, which is just another form of garbage collection. Um, okay, we know it's better, but like people outside, they probably don't know it <laughs> yet. Um, but the, the, the one challenge that you have in Swift versus the other languages, uh, which have a, what's called a tracing garbage collector, is this whole cyclic reference problem that you can have in, in Swift. Um, now, one of the good things is tools like instruments make it very easy for you to find those ahead of time. Um, but we do know that's going to be an interesting area, I think particularly on the server, where you have you know, workloads which far outstrip what you'll ever have on a device. You know, you, we have 50,000 concurrent connections you know, running 24 by 7 versus you know, someone clicking on a, on a UI occasionally. Yeah. Um, so that will amplify any problem, um, and that's why we're actually looking at whether there's better ways to do memory management, whether there's better tools that can be used for memory management. Okay, like are you, impl are you talking maybe about something like garbage collecting for Swift? No, I don't okay. think we'd be going as far as adding a full garbage collector, <laughs> particularly when, you know, I said one of the big advantages for Swift is its, yeah. is its low memory footprint. Yeah. We'd lose that if we had a full garbage collector. Okay, okay. And you were talking about like using, um, um, sorry, uh, Xcode to actually, or instruments to a profile. Can you actually do that? Like uh, develop code on your, on your Xcode machine and, and then move that to the server and be kind of uh, sure that you will have the same kind of performance um, um, I mean, uh, relatively. Like if you have some bottlenecks, it's going to be the same bottlenecks on the Mac and on the Linux uh, server yeah, so, so that you know what you have to optimize. Where we are today is you can do most of your development in Xcode um, and you can deploy that application to Linux. That, that's fine. Now, yes, you always have some environmental differences. The fact that foundation and dispatch are subtly different means that you might have some issues there. Um, one of the things we are working on is how to use Xcode remotely. So you'll be able to use the debugger remotely against a Linux deployment. So we're expecting you to have you know, shaken out most of the bugs by the time you point you do deploy, but we do know that remote debug, remote instruments, etc., yes, is going to be required. For instruments, it would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you aware of any um, production uh, use of Kitura? Uh, yes. So there's there's a couple of um, examples. One is called City Furniture. It's um, it's a US company, and they've been building a Kitura backend with us over the last three or four months. So we've been using them as like a, a test to make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, and a guy called Nick Jackson, who works for Not on the High Street in the UK. Um, We've had a, a lot of good conversations with him over time, and he tells us that he has uh, two microservices running in production using oh. Kitura. Okay, that's right. And about Ruby, like we were talking about this like huge uh, performance issue and memory issue with Ruby, uh, but still, like Ruby is super uh, successful, and I don't think it's about uh, performance. It's more about the fact that Ruby have Rails and what Swift has. Yeah, well, the interesting thing is that um, you know, Express in Node.js was kind of modeled on Rails, and yeah. Kitora is actually kind of modeled on Express, which is modeled on Rails. So if it's the programming constructs, the idea of having roots and middlewares that they like, that's actually one of the things they get when they're using Kitora. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, let's say we can do some time travel. What uh, where will it be in three years' time? Or oh, two years, maybe? Well... Hopefully, we'll have got to the point that we don't just have a, a web framework. You know, we have the ability to do um, auto scaling. So, you know, as load comes in, you will automatically add and remove Kitora instances on the back end, and we'll have high availability, disaster recovery. We'll be able to do monitoring. Um, but typically today, you know, you do monitoring of your server. So you say this URL took two milliseconds to respond. But because we have the same language in the client, we can actually look at the end-to-end -end picture. We'd be able to say that, you know, here's the UI responsiveness in the client device. And we know that that's actually caused by, you know, maybe a database connection eventually, but we'll have the full end-to-end -end picture. And I think it's things like that which are going to be interesting. I think another really interesting area is um, the Internet of Things. So uh, today, if you're building a embedded application, you're almost certainly using C. Um, and you're using that because it has these 
high performance, low memory characteristics, which Swift has, which isn't surprising because it comes from an embedded environment. And I think Swift is actually going to be really interesting for IoT in the future. And the, the overhead of uh, having Swift compared to plain C, like it's okay, it's nice because you don't have a JVM to, to embed, but you still have some kind of uh, uh, overhead compared to C. So is that like not too big? Yeah, I mean, you, you have a, a bit of extra overhead in terms of size on disk, and there's a little bit of extra overhead in terms of memory because of um, reference counting, and there's a little bit of overhead in terms of performance, um, but you get the ability to write your code significantly faster yeah. than C. Right? Swift is just much, much faster to write, and you know, the fact that you don't have to deal with malloc and free and pointer arithmetic um, oh, yes. The fact that you have optionals and these kinds of things means that, you know, if IoT explodes, then we're going to have to be building new embedded capabilities on a whole range of different um, devices and being able to do, need to do that as fast as possible. Okay, I think we, awesome. yeah. we have a lot of other questions, uh, but we really have to start because uh, we are a bit late. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for being here <laughs> and for bringing... Kitura. <laughs>